So welcome to this uh, video and audio uh, recording for the symposium uh, Navigating Transitions, Supporting uh, Adapting Policies to Young People's Changing Realities. The symposium will happen very soon at the end of June in Tirana, uh, Albania. And we would like to, uh, with this recording, we would like to help the participants uh, come a bit more prepared, come maybe uh, from the same, at the same table with the same kind of starting understandings of what is youth transitions, what it has been uh, referred to in literature, in research, but also what it implies, what it means today. And uh, to help the participants prepare for that, we have invited uh, three of our uh, very uh, knowledgeable collaborators uh, of the partnership, someone who has support, have supported the partnership for a long time, and that is Howard Williamson, Eva Kshaklevska, and uh, Maria Carmen Pantia, and they will also have contributions during the symposium. They'll be there, so if for some participants this is an interesting starting conversation, for sure you will have a chance to continue it there. And hopefully Mia as the rapporteur will also find a way to channel some of this um, sharing in the report later on. Nice to hear ourselves now and then uh, see soon uh, in Tirana. Uh, I'm Ewa Krzaklewska. I'm a youth sociologist who works uh, in Krakow, Poland at the Jagiellonian University. Um, youth transitions has been uh, my topic um, of research for years and uh, with, let's say, big work that I have done looking at the transitions of young people uh, at the beginning of this uh, of the century, seeing how the transitions have changed. So I'm happy to be here to discuss uh, the youth transitions and what how have they are changing now in the recent years. Hello, my name is Maria Carmen Panta and I'm professor at the Department of Social Work at Babes Boy University in Romania. Uh, I'm a member of the advisory group of the Pool of European Youth Researchers and also a member of the European Commission Expert Group on Quality Investment in Education and Training. I'm fascinated by uh, young people's relationships with the world of work in it, its uh, different forms from vocational education and training, entrepreneurship, precarious work, and overqualification, especially for the young graduates. And I'm very happy that uh, this symposium is taking place now and we'll have the chance to, to share more of our own reflections on uh, how the nature and the significance uh, of work changes for the young people. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Howard Williamson. <coughs> um, I've uh, been involved in the triangle of research policy and practice around young people for a long time. I ran a youth centre for 25 years. I wrote an article about transitions in 1985 called Struggling Beyond Youth, <coughs> which is probably one of the early versions of this debate. Um, I was involved in policy making since the 70s on the transition from school to work. And... Um, and I'm part, <coughs> like uh, Mia and Eva, I'm also a member of the pair advisory group. How is youth transitions defined in literature? Uh, maybe you all have seen, have had, uh, have worked with the same theoretical approaches. Maybe you've seen different definitions. It's quite interesting, just the whole word transitions, because it used to be transitions from school to work. And then it was kind of transitions from what and where to. And then people started to theorize it a bit more and talk about the kind of education to employment transition and then the family of origin to family of destination transition and then the dependent to independent living transitions, transition. So you have, you have a sort of economic transition, a, a, a domestic transition and a housing transition. Uh, and more recently, you've also got the what might be called street transitions, which are young people who are kind of excluded, who <clears throat> drop out of school and find new pathways to adulthood. And what uh, the European debate is now calling transitions to autonomy, whatever that means. Um, and, uh, you know, autonomy can mean many different things to young people in different ways. And 
And there's a lot of theories around it, a lot of imagery, a lot of metaphors, a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of ideas that, uh, and and it's transitioned from what kind of age to what kind of age. They've got longer and longer and longer, from sort of twelve to forty, when it used to be sort of sixteen and seventeen year olds. Uh, and it's become more reversible. So it used to be you leave home and or you get a job and then you leave home and you you sorry you get a job you build a relationship you leave home this kind of linear transitions and now it's all jumbled up and <clears throat> moves in different ways. Boomerang kids leave home and they come back. Uh, so you've got uh, all these complexities, this prolongation of transitions, uh, this reversibility of transitions. So, and I'm sure Eva and Mia know much more about recent sort of academic research on this, and they could probably pick up that baton and take those that thinking forward. If I, I could follow and like try to uh, uh, reflect like what we we mean by transitions, I would think of uh, some uh, life course events that happen. Yes, and something when a, a person tries tries to imagine their their kind of life path or kind of one biography, then we think, okay, there will be some critical events where we will maybe change status, we become someone else. So you will we will transition. We'll transition from a student to a worker. We can transition from being a child to being a parent ourselves. So I think maybe if we connect transitions to, to events and also those who we often celebrate with some rituals like graduation party or or a wedding or maybe uh, um, some some baby shower party, then we could think that these are some critical moments that that would happen and will mark our life course yes and uh, and it happens that actually they they used to be very much concentrated uh, around similar age somewhere around at 20 25 and they would be cumulated they will um, often happen in uh, together that we will leave home we will get become a husband wife a partner and get a child and uh, what we observe is that uh, actually um, it stopped to be just a kind of a simple fast passage from one stage of kind of being dependent, non-autonomous to being someone who is now uh, by its own, let's say, um, autonomous, uh, some economically sustainable. Um, and we see that, uh, and some sociologists uh, or even social psychologists define it as a new kind of uh, period of life, which is full of this uh, uncertainty of status when when young people actually may may have a transitioned in work but they did not yet choose to transit in for example their family uh, change their family status so i um what uh, howard also mentioned is that uh, um that we can now start to think of uh, young age as in general, kind of a transitional uh, period of life, the, the life that people, young people are changing, exploring, seeing what decisions they should take about this life events, and they are not anymore take it for granted. They are not anymore um, as sure that they would happen. They might also not choose uh, some of these transitions, like familial transition, to to happen. So I think we are some some so youth sociology moved from seeing uh, life course as yes. Um, there will be some events that will happen and we have to just measure when and how and what can support it to now more kind of more debatable aspects. But I think what also Howard started from, that this economic transition is still there and uh, this one that most people expect and would need the, the support and the policy support is needed. Well, Mia, maybe you mentioned uh, yes. you are fascinated with the young people's relation to work and uh, their place and positioning to it. So uh, just building on what uh, Howard and Eva said, is there anything in particular that uh, is explored, for example, in this dimension? Yes, yes. I, I could uh, barely add to complexity, if I may, and uh, and say that, well, transitions are not necessarily a youth phenomenon. As long as, as Eva said, we'll, we have societies going from 
an oppressive system to liberal democracy or the other way around. So we have uh, our collective understanding of, of uh, life uh, incorporates the idea that uh, there are transitions and sometimes unexpected transitions that are not that much linear anymore. So the idea that uh, the future is a continuation of the per present uh, and the prolongation of the past is uh, not much uh, tenable. Um, what I would like to, to strengthen for the participants is the contribution of youth studies to the understanding of youth transitions in comparison, for instance, with psychology, where the idea of um, youth transition uh, is uh, being um, uh, discussed uh, in, a, in a different uh, manner. For instance, psychology has a focus on the individual and how uh, the life uh, stages uh, are uh, being, um, are, are unfolding uh, in a developmental uh, way. So it, uh, psychology has a developmental perspective uh, over adolescence and not youth whilst the uh, youth studies look at the young people as a social group, as a collective that has uh, its, um, that is permanent for society, yet for the individual it's, um, it's a stage. So uh, youth studies are more concerned with the structural uh, conditions that make uh, youth experience as it is at the collective uh, level um, in a moment in time. So it's more concerned with the dynamics, with the institutions, with the experiences of the young people at the collective level. Could I just capture two key points that I think Mira and Eva have, have, have talked about in, in, in their remarks? One is this whole sense of development, because certainly one of the major contributions to the discussion has been this idea of emerging adulthood, <clears throat> as if there's a, a new developmental phase in the 20s, <clears throat> critics say this is focused on college students and misses out a whole uh, <clears throat> much wider group of young people. So there's a whole question about inequalities in transitions and whether they're getting wider. And the second point that I think Eva sort of touched on was, and, and, and Mia has also talked about it, is this relationship between sort of choice or agency, as it's often called in theory, um, and structure, and to what extent are young people choosing new pathways to adulthood or are they <coughs> are structural forces propelling them into particular positions where they have little choice? And I think the symposium needs to constantly have those two ideas in, in, in mind when they're thinking through these issues. If I could add one thing, I think we can also um, uh, think as, uh, of transitions as a very useful uh, tool um, to measure change, and I think that uh, is also something that sociologists uh, use a lot, because on one hand we say this is something like how we can count that people uh, transit or not, and I think uh, this... Uh, even quantitative approach to transitions, when we measure at what age people uh, transit, what is the percent of people who make certain transitions, I think that's very important because it helps us to uh, to see uh, social change, how uh, these transitions are actually developing. And I think uh, we could think of transition as uh, various uh, good indicators of, uh, of, for example, changing uh, labor market conditions or uh, as uh, a measurement if some policy actually supported uh, entrance to the labor market. So if we think about indicator specific, you know, uh, percentages, I think that's also a, a good and important way to think about transitions in the light of policy because they can give us some uh, indicate indications for, uh, for action. Uh, at the institutional level, because we talk about yes about you as as a as a as a as a group, it's quite fascinating that in the first round, just looking at trying to to see the different angles of how transitions can be defined, we understand the complexity of it. But uh, maybe it's good to have these pointers for the participants that it's it it allows us to look at individual, collective, and societal levels. And uh, some of you already mentioned uh, the connection with policies, and that's the other part of the title of our symposium, adapting policies to young people's changing realities. And some of you already started saying that, okay, even the approaches to looking at transitions have have changed, have evolved, but we know very well, and in the symposium we will look especially at this large societal 
challenges and how they impact young people's transitions today. And today it's after a couple of years of uh, COVID-related measures that for some young people were absolutely uh, very strong and impactful and for others maybe they were more they offered more opportunities and we are in a in a time of war in active war in Europe and we are in a time of uh, climate degradation and there is a big struggle for climate justice that young people are mobilizing around and uh, we are undergoing digital transitions at paces that uh, Individually, we cannot grasp. So all these large societal challenges, they impact young people's transitions. And so my question to you is, what about youth policy here? What, how do you think that uh, we should be, what, what should we be looking at? Because in a sense, transition was taken as a basis for a lot of youth policy measures to support young people, to complement what other policies are doing, education, social, health, and so on, to support young people to grow confident, get agency, be strong, participate, learn, uh, do youth work, do youth organizations, volunteering, and so on. So here we are today in 2022, and how relevant is that? People think this is a relatively recent debate. And I mean, there are, there's a sociological literature, certainly going back to the 1950s, about <coughs> transition, post Second World War transitions. They were different. And there were issues about schooling, um, whether schooling was divisive or inclusive. Uh, there are a whole set of issues about the uh, the shocks that may face young people as they kind of hit the labor market and discovered what a brutal and ruthless um, <clears throat> context that might become, whatever their dreams may have been. I mean, Norbert Elias, famous uh, philosopher, philosophical and theoret- theoretical sort of uh, social scientist, uh, talked about shock theory. But then other people were writing and saying, actually, the transitions were quite smooth and easy in the 1960s. <clears throat> um but uh, people still had to have policy to prepare young people for the new technological opportunities that they were going to face. And then psychologists were writing about too much job changing. So you needed policy to provide careers guidance that uh, settled young people in the right pathways to adulthood as early as possible so they didn't drift around in their late teens and early 20s. Uh, in Western Europe, and of course, Mir and Eva come from different pa- a different part of Europe with a different history. Um, but certainly in Western Europe and in the United Kingdom, the big de- policy debate about transition started after the oil crisis of 1973. Sudden massive rise in youth unemployment. The I can't get a job because I have no experience. I can't get experience because I haven't got a job. So. You needed policy in place to provide work experience and labour market um, uh, uh, intervention possibilities for young people to bridge that gap. I mean, that was a key kind of policy idea of bridging the gap uh, with training schemes, vocational training schemes, and so on and so forth. And increasingly, we've tried to, you know, it's all about, policy is all about trying to, A, Two things. One is to smooth the the journey so that there are not too many bumps in the road. And the other one is to ensure that the inequalities that arise from sort of freely determined transitions can be reduced to some extent by providing greater opportunities for more disadvantaged young people. If I if I may, yes, indeed, different Countries have different stories to tell, as Howard rightly mentions. Uh, I I tend to to extend the arguments maybe for other countries from the with a uh, communist um, uh, history in the sense of, um, of telling to, to participants that well the governance of youth transitions was an important political issue in the former um, communist countries. Uh, with fast track transitions being prioritized, that means the transition from school to work without the university and the lengthy uh, uh, entry into the the employment. 
uh, family formation was very strongly linked with the pronatalist uh, policies and the housing transitions were uh, conditioned upon uh, family transitions. So the state did support um, the housing, uh, but in the same time, uh, there were uh, pronatalist policies that um, linked uh, housing uh, with uh, with family formation and not with uh, autonomous uh, living, as uh, one may put uh, it uh, this way uh, today. Um, right after the fall of the communist system, um, I would tend to believe that uh, well, youth studies uh, went through um, a period of um, invisibility or prudence. Uh, during communism, um, youth was a strong, um, attached to strong ideological uh, stances. Um, but uh, right, right after the interest in the young people's lives was uh, uh, absent uh, in, in several countries. Uh, this absence was part of a political stance. Uh, I would say uh, young people were not at the front edge of political change. Uh, the moral panic was attached uh, with young people's uh, political agency and their potential uh, political agency. And that, that way migration as a solution came, uh, at least uh, in, in Romania, and I see Eva agreeing uh, uh, with that. So it is uh, more recently that youth studies in the sense of, an, of uh, um, I would say, authentic um, scientific um, inquiry uh, re-emerges uh, um, in the former communist countries. And I, I really acknowledge the role of the youth partnership in doing that for, for many uh, countries from the region. Uh, in respect to research, uh, youth work, uh, and uh, also uh, policy making, so I, I think that uh, at least at least for for um, several countries I'm aware of, youth partnership was really influential in in um, raising um, um, a group of of uh, researchers um, with um, a wider understanding of of. Uh, the debates and able to position the situation of uh, young people from their countries in the wider uh, picture, which is um, so much, much needed. Youth was not really in focus of research and youth transition certainly was not after the collapse of uh, the communist and socialist bloc. And young people chose migration because they could not find their way to channel their to, to participate, to engage, and they were not seen, actually. They were tr being kept away from the decision-making for quite a while. And only now uh, these countries realize we need young people to do something uh, useful. And so there is interest in, in researching, in understanding, and in developing kind of more supportive programs for young people. Is, did I understand a bit right uh, what you were saying? Yes, Yes, I, I would say that, yes, indeed, I would say that young people's, at the collective level, young people's choice to, to leave their countries, uh, I would connect this with the, the um, uh, political com complicity in, in making this happen. Um, young people were not at the forefront of the, the, the political change, um, to, uh, despite the demographic structure at the time, because many were leaving the countries. So a, pa a part of the um, way democracies look like in Eastern Europe can be attributed to the um, migration process that was tacitly uh, supported uh, or even explicitly supported by uh, governments. Very, very interesting. So, Eva, what would you like to add to this? <clears throat> Thanks. I think it's this historical perspective and also how uh, um, uh, at different moments of time youth transitions maybe become interest of policy. I think it may be giving a European example. Uh, I think the time was after the um, economic uh, crisis and the uh, the moment that uh, the um, entrance to the labor market of many young Europeans actually be became very diffi difficult, I think this is where 
I remember from my like research life that the transition uh, came into the European discourse on on youth policy when they talked about youth guarantee and the necessity to support young people in this uh, in this uh, particular pathway uh, from school to the labor market, that it needs to be guaranteed somehow that there is not like a br- break in this transition. So I, I, this, this is what I remember very strongly when this, when this, uh, when this transition concept uh, entered European youth policy. And I think even European youth strategy was um, mm, at that time uh, used language of uh, somehow investing and empowering and i think it was investing in the structures for youth transition and also kind of this so this kind of more uh, structural institutional level so how like state and country with its institutions and policies services can support this 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 youth transitions and on the other hand this individual so how it can empower and kind of also maybe more neoliberal discourse how you should like uh, make people responsible for their own pathways. They all came somehow in this in this moment uh, uh, of the of youth policy. Um, <clears throat> if I could uh, add to this um, kind of more general reflection, I think uh, this youth transitions uh, concept uh, it can help us also to compare uh, welfare regimes. It can compare structures. In fact, it can. Uh, uh, allow us to compare what resources young people w- have in the countries, I think. And there is a lot of great work done of sociologists who try to see what is this context, what are the conditions in, in which young people transit. And I think that is an uh, uh, important tool for us to, to, to see this uh, as dependent on uh, the country provisions for young people. And here where the policy comes, you know, which solutions for young people, what vision of young people as Maria was uh, talking about this different changing visions, how they impact what the state is doing and how this can support uh, young people. Mm. And third uh, thought uh, was about inequalities and I think that's uh, critical and I think the reflection around youth transitions always was uh, somehow having in mind uh, those excluded, those marginalized that, that face difficulties in transitions. Maybe some other people would like to follow on this discussion, but I think this bridging gap and really uh, seeing who uh, falls out, uh, who cannot make it, uh, who is outside of the pathways that was always um, in the interest of researchers, of it was always the care of pe- of societies and aim of policies, I think. Um, I think it's very important to uh, remember that because Eva's picked up these words, investment, empowering and so on, there's lots of what we call in English weasel words attached to all of this debate. You know, employability. Mia mentioned earlier about overqualification and credentialism. The young generation in Europe is better qualified than any generation before it. So it's not as if they're short of qualifications or the right aptitudes and, and skills necessarily. They may be, but but probably not. Uh, it's the labour market has transformed dramatically. Guarantees is another weasel word. Guarantees guarantee nothing, and there's a whole mythology about youth guarantees. It was the youth guarantee in the United Kingdom in 1986 that produced. The what I called state of zero youth at that time, who subsequently became known as the NEETs, who are now the big focus of policy around the world. And the reason people <coughs> fall out of education, employment and training, even when there are guarantees, is because they think the guarantees don't guarantee anything. They don't promise anything. So it's got to be the right kind of guarantee, one that is meaningful and relevant to young people. Uh, and the third point I would want to make, because I've spent my life researching young people who have been kicked out or dropped out of schools and training programs and labour markets, um, you know, my my famous Milltown Boys ethnography of 50 years, but, you know, unless unless these young people die prematurely, they have to make a life, they have to create their own transitions and they have to find new ways through, often with very little policy support or policy support that is best avoided, which is like criminal criminal justice system. So um, there are, you know, there are many routes that are taken. And 
the Council of Europe particularly and the European Union and Commission uh, perhaps slightly less so, but nevertheless still is largely focused and quite rightly on opportunity and experiential possibilities in transition rather than seeing all the transition issues as problems that need to be tackled through more regulation, more punitive responses and so on. We do have a policy choice all the time as to whether to extend opportunities to <coughs> more marginalised groups that are positive or to try and regulate them more often. And one final remark here is that policy has been manifestly uh, appalling in its inability to really take the time, have the patience to reach out to the most vulnerable and most marginalised. Policy, even when it is opportunity focused and directed at those more vulnerable and marginalised groups, tends to pick the easy ones to reach and does not ever reach the really most marginalised. And therefore, as Eva says, the inequalities around transition have extended dramatically in recent years. Yes, I think that Howard's uh, point um, is, is really insightful. Um, well, and I see also the, the discourse on celebrating young people's agency as part of the same complicit um, um, policy uh, stance in the way that uh, in, in some way um, a po a policymaking uh, risks abandoning uh, young people while uh, projecting um, an empowering, isn't it, uh, message on their own capacity to, to make it. Uh, and I find this, um, this uh, focus on, on young people's uh, agency, uh, whilst legitimate, um, it, it calls for, for deeper reflection and, and criticism uh, when it is uh, used as a substitute for meaningful policy making. That's a good moment to ask for final reflections on what you think uh, the participants in the symposium should be thinking about when they come to, to these two days uh, and a bit of working together. What for you is meaning, for example, quite a few of you said policy never reaches out uh, to the really uh, the ones who are really in need of it or it creams the top, you know, the reaches to the easy ones and so on. Well, what do you think already um, we should be reflecting on in terms of policy change needed? Can youth policy do it all? And if not, which policies should be doing more? And uh, yeah, your your final messages to the participants. Well, so that I don't end up going last, I'll go first again now, and then Eva and Mir will, <coughs> who have a more contemporary understanding of some of these issues. I mean, we're all talking about COVID recovery now, and of course the inequalities have been made worse by COVID, and a lot of transitions have been blocked in a whole variety of psychological and material ways. But I think the transitions debate and the policy agenda is fundamentally the same, which is about the resource allocation to young people. And the resources are about what in academic life are called the capitals. Uh, they're about human capital, social capital and identity capital. So human capital is about education, um, <clears throat> qualifications, and so on. Social capital is about contacts and networks, uh, you know, sort of pathways of influence, if you like, and identity capital is actually knowing how to, to behave in, in different, very different contexts, where I once gave a lecture about uh, enterprise and compliance and passivity and entrepreneurial uh, behavior. Uh, if young people get it wrong, they get kicked out or they get left behind. So it's not about being enterprising all the time or being passive and compliant all the time. It's about knowing the context you are in. And many young people are more skilled than many other young people in, in, in knowing that story. Um, the word precarity is another weasel word that is used in, 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 in lots of ways about precarious <coughs> pathways, precarious employment. You know, in Africa, we'd probably be talking about 97% of young people are in precarious situations. But I think 
Australia has been doing some research recently called the Youth Life Patterns Survey, and they come up with the concept of new adulthood, which I'm not sure is really that new. But what they very usefully point to is what might be called positive precarity in contrast to negative precarity. Now, negative precarity are those young people who are compelled to enter precarious situations in the labour market because they don't have any support. They've got to live from quite a young age. They don't have time to explore options, to take risks. That They've got to knuckle down in the gig economy because that's the only way they're going to get through. And often they find themselves abandoned and, and beached around the age of maybe 25 or 30. They've missed the boat. They've lost the chance. Whereas positive precarity are those young people who can't find anything stable and secure and uh, purposeful and meaningful, but they have resources behind them. They have parents. So it's what they call in Australia asset transfer. So parents are able to support their kids in living precarious lives for some years sometimes uh, to explore where they want to go, what they want to do, what they want to be in their lives. And that's quite a positive thing that we need to create space for uh, young people. And one final remark is that you mentioned, Tanya, earlier about (coughs) uh, youth work. And, of course, the whole 10-year history of youth work project concluded that really youth work is about winning spaces for young people and supporting their transitions, transit zone and forum. And the problem is that our most vulnerable and marginalised, socially excluded, fewer opportunities, whatever you want to call them, those kinds of young people, they really don't have space to try things out, to experiment, to because they don't have identity or economic or network resources behind them to enable to do that. So I think the big message for me, as it has been throughout my life, is about how we make sure that better resources of those different types can be made available to more young people. To me, it is important for the participants to to develop their awareness at the uh, policy discourses um, and the context, as Howard well said, uh, around them, they need to speak the language of the policy making if they want to have a say at the policy table. So I find this uh, symposium and the discussions as a wonderful exercise for them to to um, to be prepared for for such encounters in in their uh, own uh, um, context. Um, I would also um, provoke the participants to to reflect on the concepts and on the metaphors that are now uh, so uh, widespread in their own working lives, for instance. So we have concepts like the race for the job, for jobs, uh, hunt for talent, uh, jobs seen as opportunities, um, and the impression that there is uh, not enough for everyone, so uh, they should be in competition for some sort of um, um, final uh, reward. Well, uh, I I would provoke them to think more in terms of the things that that connect young people, uh, things that are able to provide alternatives to to these metaphors, which are not the only ones possible. And I I truly believe that uh, the symposium and the workshops are able to build up an understanding of our shared humanity, if you want, or uh, the the sense of... of, uh, um empathy and um, um cooperation that uh, that uh, needs to be uh cherished uh, more than the um the metaphor of the the race especially in terms of the labor market yeah thanks for both great messages um i um I would also uh, call for this more critical view on uh, on the language of policies and uh, uh, how young people are looked upon. What are these figures of view that are being created in the in the media, in the public sphere through the policy? Um, when I teach my students, they always kind of. The, I think mostly in the recent years, they really don't like this concept of transition because they feel it's very normative. It really is kind of like 
almost like a controlling concept that is kind of like putting very strong expectations and it doesn't leave them free. So I, I find it, is, it was interesting that in the recent years, they kind of really like uh, dislike uh, this notion of transi uh, transition and they find it very oppressive somehow that they should just marry or have children and they have to do it in a certain way. You know, they, they, they really try to... Uh, and the, the um, and I think this normativity and expectations are somehow hard for them to to uh, to uh, to kind of um, confront, and they they don't like it. Um, and I think it's also because when we talk about transitions, we always think that youth is somehow like in the future and this kind of notion they should become something that they are not here. So maybe that's another like last uh, kind of a thought that yeah. Um, and it connects to this, this thinking about spaces. So youth should become something, but they are also here. So I think in policy, we also should not uh, um, kind of um, exclude also those uh, so, uh, policy uh, aims that directed are that young people at young people's spaces being here, um, not just becoming something in the future. Uh, and that will be my maybe thought also for, for, uh, for symposium participants. Thank you. Thank you very much to the three of you. It's been uh, fascinating, I have to say. Um, and it's only the start. We hope that this uh, will be motivating the participants and uh, lead them to maybe search through some uh, of the written work, but also prepare in their, as, as you mentioned, Mia, think about it uh, in their own context, what it means and uh, what they want to discuss uh, with others. So maybe uh, we say for now, goodbye all together to the participants, but uh, see you very soon, actually, in Tirana. And uh, see you around the tables for more debates and for further exploring the concept of transitions and actually how policies need to change to reflect the, re the changing realities of young people. Mm -hmm.